God's grace and peace be with you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to worship on this, the second Sunday of Christmas. Yes, we are still in Christmas tide. We go through these 12 days, which lead up to Epiphany, the day that we mark when the wise people came and found Jesus and his birth was known throughout the world. I've got my star replacing my poinsettia in honor of Epiphany coming up this week. We are so delighted that you are joining us for worship. Greetings to all of you on our Zoom. Greetings to those who are tuning in on Facebook Live, those who are watching this later on. We hope that you are blessed by this time, and we hope that you feel God's love in abundance. As we prepare for worship, I'm going to invite you, if you have a candle at home that you're able to light, I've got my star that I use throughout Advent and for Christmas, it feels appropriate for Epiphany as well. Uh, and we're going to light a candle to remind ourselves that this is a sacred time. And we're going to set an intention for this time and space as a time for worship. So let us prepare our hearts and our minds for worship. Hear now our call to worship. There is good news of great joy for all. Our Savior is born the Messiah, the Lord. Let us pray. Today, God, may we be like Mary and Joseph, putting all our energy into looking for you. Today, may we be like the teachers in the temple, making room for young people and their questions. Today, God, may we be like Jesus, knowing our place is to be about your work. Amen. It is our practice each week to say together our mission statements, and I invite you to join me as we say it together. New Covenant Fellowship is a racially diverse community informed by the Bible, empowered by the Holy Spirit, and motivated to share God's love with all. In response to God's love, we are called to equip disciples to faithfully serve, to encourage seekers to joyfully commit, and to implore all to worship our Lord as we love our neighbors, grow in grace, and live by faith. I invite Jimmy to lead us in singing Angels from the Realm of Glory. Brighter visions beam afar. 
seek the great desire of nations ye have seen in his natal star. Come and worship, come and worship, worship Christ the newborn King. All creation join in praising God the Father, Spirit, Son. Evermore your voice is raising to the eternal three in one. Come and worship, come and worship, worship Christ the newborn King. Hear now our call to confession. The grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all and teaching us to renounce what is evil in this world. Trusting in God's grace, let us confess our sin. Just when we think we know you, Lord, you amaze us again. We admit that in the midst of all that's going on, we have sometimes coasted on our assumptions rather than paying close attention. We think we know what you are about. And so when we lose sight of you, we don't know where to look. Yet you are always about God's kingdom business. We pray you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear to recognize you and your work in and beyond our expectations. Amen. Let us take a moment for silent confession. Amen. Hear the promise of the Lord. See, your salvation has come. You are a holy people redeemed by God, sought out and not forsaken. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. As we move into our time of hearing the word of God read and proclaimed, I invite you to pray with me the prayer for illumination as we invite the Holy Spirit to guide us. I'm going to say a line and you're invited to repeat it after me. There's even some hand motions involved if you would like to partake of that and we will pray together. Let us pray. Oh God, open our ears and our hearts so we can hear your word. Amen. So this week, we are continuing in the Gospel of Luke, and we will be working through this text all the way through Easter in the coming months. And during this time, we are going to hear a rather more detailed version of the story of Jesus. The other Gospel writers focus on different aspects or different perspectives but Luke is one who is known for sharing more detail than the others. That's why we use Luke on Christmas Eve for the nativity scene, those Christmas pageants. The other gospel writers don't quite do as much with the angels and the shepherds and the drama of Christ's birth. And today we're gonna to hear one of those stories that Luke highlights that we don't find elsewhere in scripture. We're going to hear the story of Jesus as a boy. 
and the time that he went into the temple. So before we hear our story for today, I'm going to invite you to wonder with me for just a moment. I wonder what questions and ideas Jesus had as a boy. I wonder if God likes it when we have lots of questions. I wonder how Mary and Joseph felt when they couldn't find Jesus. So I invite you to ponder those questions as we hear our scripture passage today, which comes from Luke chapter two, and will be in verses 41 through 52. And thanks to Bonnie for linking that in the chat. If you would like to follow along, I invite you to go grab your Bible, or you can just click on the link and read along online. Let us listen for the word of God. Now, every year, his parents, that's Jesus, went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up as usual for the festival. When the festival was ended and they started to return, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but his parents did not know it. Assuming that he was in the group of travelers, they went a day's journey. Then they started to found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, child, why have you treated us like this? Look, your father and I have been searching for you in great anxiety. He said to them, why were you searching for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he said to them. Then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was obedient to them. His mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in years and in divine and human favor. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. On a scale of one to 10, how terrified do you think Mary and Joseph were when they realized they left Jesus in Jerusalem? I can't help but think of that movie, Home Alone, when Kevin's parents are on the plane to France and Kevin's mother is trying to figure out what she forgot to do at home before they left and it finally dawns on her that they forgot their son. Kevin, she screams on the plane as she realizes the mistake that they've made. They didn't triple check to make sure that all of the kids were on the plane. Perhaps a similar mistake was made by Jesus's family. I wonder if some cousin was tasked with doing the head count as the family headed back to Nazareth. Maybe they miscounted. It must have been a very large gathering for them to overlook Jesus's absence. Do you suppose that their panic is heightened because they know just how special this particular child is? Of course, any nurturing parent would be anxious if they were to lose a child, but these particular parents are also parenting on behalf of God. Mary and Joseph have known from the start that their son 
would be the son of God, the promised one who would come to change the world, you could say there was some added responsibility when it came to raising Jesus. It's quite possible that they felt extraordinarily anxious when they realized they lost God's son. I can relate to this on a very, very small scale. When JT, the kids and I were visiting family up in Seattle a few years ago, we went to a seafood festival. And there was the typical fare that you would find at such a festival. There were carnival games and food and lots and lots of people, which feels a little disorienting to think about after months of avoiding big crowds during this pandemic. But once upon a time, we used to go to events like that with lots of people around. Well, at this festival, there was this row of bounce houses that the kids could play in. And our kids, of course, wanted in on the action. My brother-in-law needed to give a bottle to their infants. And so JT and I offered to watch their older kiddo, our nephew. Abigail took off with her cousin into a Mickey Mouse bounce house. And JT and I stayed out front to keep an eye on them. After a few minutes, Abigail emerged out the exit door, but our nephew did not pop out with her. We asked her if she knew where he was, but being only two, she didn't have the slightest idea why we would be asking her that. She only had her eyes on the princess bounce castle next door. She was ready to move on. And so JT went with her to the next bounce house and I walked around Mickey Mouse expecting to see our nephew still bouncing inside, but I didn't see him in there. When I got around to the back of the bounce house, my heart dropped. There was a second exit on the back side of this bounce house. Clearly, this was not designed by parents of two-year-olds. Who would put two exits on a bounce house? Panic started to set in. I couldn't see him anywhere. We searched and we searched. And finally, about five minutes later, we saw him over by some carnival games. Those five minutes felt like some of the longest minutes of my life. Now, I would have been scared if it had been my own child, but there was this added anxiety because this was somebody else's child that I had lost. There was this added pressure to make sure he was okay because he didn't belong to me. In my sacred imagination, I picture Mary and Joseph in a similar panic, knowing they have misplaced a child who doesn't really belong to them. They know they are taking care of him on behalf of God. They are stewards of this precious child. But one thing I love <clears throat> about this passage is that it portrays Jesus as a relatively ordinary kid. This 12 year old boy was old enough to know that he should have stayed with his traveling party and instead he stays behind in Jerusalem. Perhaps it was an act of rebellion, pretty typical for a kid that age. And when his parents do find him, his response is so wonderfully typical of a kid that age. As one of the members of our youth group pointed out when we looked at this text earlier this week, Jesus is rather sassy when he responds to his parents. He tells them they should have known where he would be. I can just hear the sarcasm in his voice. Jesus, the preteen, sassing his parents. What could be more ordinary? The thing is, no one outside of this family had any clue about his identity. Only those in his immediate family 
know who he is and God's promise for his life. And even then, perhaps with the exception of Mary, none of them really know just how special he is. Up until this point, they've treated him like a typical kid in a working class family growing up in Palestine. But then there's this scene when he goes to the temple and asks questions, he engages his curiosity, but he also answers questions. He shows that he understands much. Everyone is amazed by this kid. We see this hint that <clears throat> he's not just an ordinary kid. <clears throat> Those who are around him, they are amazed by his wisdom, but they still don't know the depth of just how stunning he is. I think it's important to remember that in his community, he is just an ordinary kid. And I love that Luke makes special mention of Jesus as a kid. We hear about his birth and his baptism in other gospels, but none of the other gospels talk about Jesus's adolescence. There's this big gap in the story. But Luke is intentional about highlighting this part of Jesus's life, making sure that it is remembered as part of his story. It isn't clear if Luke has much of an opinion about the status of adolescence in the world, but it is curious that the gospel writer would include this part of Jesus's life. Luke tends to make special mention of those on the margins, the people who wouldn't ordinarily get written down in history, Jesus has a special highlight for those who are poor, those who are sick. Luke makes special mention of women throughout this gospel, giving them a sense of purpose and honor. Could it be that Luke is doing the same here with youth? Here in this story of Jesus at the temple, lifting up the importance of adolescence a demographic that wasn't given much attention until recent history in our world. Later in the Gospel of Luke, we find the story of Jesus blessing the little children, even though the disciples told him to pay them no mind. Perhaps Jesus has a special place in his heart for children and for youth because he was once a boy a boy who sought out those teachers in the temple because he had so many questions, but he also had so much wisdom to offer. It is important that Jesus was once a kid. It is important that God didn't just enter this world as a fully developed adult. God experienced childhood and all the growing pains that go along with it. It is important to remember that Jesus didn't just launch from the manger to his baptism. It turns out he was a kid at one point, and we have Luke to thank for lifting up this part of the story. This story in Jesus, about Jesus in the temple reveals how Jesus's heart for young ones was formed because he was once in adolescent and to have the adults around him just brush him off. Perhaps we can take notes from those teachers in the temple who welcomed Jesus and his questions, and they dialogued with him for three long days. They didn't write him off. They didn't tell him that he should just go find his youth group buddies. They welcomed him into that sacred space, that important space, and they respected his presence and his wisdom. 
Our congregation is doing this work through the Reboot Youth Program. This grant, this program is helping us to be better equipped to integrate our young ones into the life of our church, making sure that we're not just keeping them siloed away from main worship or grown up worship as it's sometimes called, but helping us to recognize that young ones are just as much a part of this church as everybody else. And we would do well to make that space for them so that we can learn from them and with them. In this coming year, I look forward to seeing the ways that we at New Covenant invite our young ones and the wisdom and leadership that they offer. Following the example of those teachers in the temple who encouraged Jesus to explore his faith. As we see later in his ministry, Jesus indeed has a heart for children and youth. And he invites us into that same care and respect for those younger than us. As we recognize together how much they have to offer us and our world and our church. Because these brilliant young ones call us to be like that boy in the temple, deepening our faith and asking questions to seek understanding. Thanks be to God. Amen. I invite Jimmy and Kimberly to lead us as we sing O Holy Night. And I invite y'all to sing really loud because my voice is a little scratchy today. <laughs> Drown me out, people. And in his 
his name all oppression shall cease sweet hands of joy and grateful chorus praise me let all within us praise his holy name From the fullness of God, we have all received grace upon grace. Let us offer our lives to the Lord. We invite you to send your offerings in the mail to our church. The physical address is on the slide, or you can donate online through our website. We are so grateful for you for supporting our church and ensuring that our ministry continues to thrive. Let us pray as we dedicate our offerings. Gracious one, you have given us so much and expect nothing in return, but out of love and gratitude, we dedicate these, our gifts of time, talent, and treasure. Bless them for the work of your kingdom. Amen. And now let us sing the doxology. Friends, we are blessed with the opportunity to gather at the table each and every week when we worship together, even now as we engage with this virtual worship space. And we are trusting that the Holy Spirit is working in mighty ways. So whatever you have on hand, grab something to eat, something to drink, we are trusting that the Holy Spirit can work with what you've got. No need to get special elements, uh, but we are trusting that she will bring the real presence of Christ to you and to the elements that you have on hand. 
And as we approach this table, we are reminded that this is Christ's table. He is the one who sets the invitation to partake. So anyone who has just a little bit of faith, you are welcome at this table. Let us pray. Gracious God, from the very beginning of time, you proclaimed your love for us and for this world when you created us in your image. We fell away from you though, and we fell into sin. And throughout the generations, we pushed further and further away, even though you tried to call us back. It wasn't until in the fullness of time, you sent your son, Jesus Christ, the one who would embody grace and reconciliation, doing the work for us that we could not do for ourselves. We give thanks for this abundant gift. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these gifts that the bread we break and the cup we bless may be the body and blood of Jesus Christ. Unite us with all of the saints in every time and every place who fellowship at this table. It is in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. On the night that our Lord was arrested, he was at supper with his disciples. And he took bread, and after giving thanks to God, he broke it. And he said, this is my body given for you. Take, eat, do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took a cup. And when he poured it out, he said, this is the cup of the new covenant sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Every time you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you proclaim the saving power of our risen Lord until he comes again. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I invite you to serve yourselves and each other at home. Should nothing of our effort stand, no legacy survive unless the Lord does raise the house in vain, its builders strive. To you who boast tomorrow's gain, tell me. What is your life amidst that vanishes at dawn? All glory be to Christ. All glory be to Christ our King. All glory be to Christ. His rule and reign will ever sing. All glory be to Christ. His will be done, His kingdom come on earth as is above. Who is Himself our daily bread? Praise Him, the Lord of love. Let living water satisfy the thirsty without Christ. <laughs> we'll take a cup of kindness, yet all glory be to Christ. All glory be to Christ, our 
Thank you, Jimmy and Kimberly, for that beautiful gift of music. Friends, if you are curious about this life of faith, if this time of worship has sparked something in you that you want to know more about what it means to follow Christ, we would love to talk with you and pray with you as we explore our faith together. You can reach out to us through our website or any of our social media outlets, and we would love for any of our elders or deacons or myself uh, to talk with you and pray with you. Let us pray now. Gracious God, at this table, you have revealed your abundant love for us, and we pray that we would remember that love and mercy as we go about our week ready to share that love with all we encounter. In Christ's name we pray, amen. As we begin this new year, we have some wonderful things going on in the life of our church. Uh, the first announcement that we have is for the Super Bowl Smackdown. <clears throat> this is our annual Super Bowl, uh, Super Bowl of Caring, where we collect canned goods for the food pantry. And we are going to engage in a competition with other churches in the presbytery. And this is gonna go all the way through February 7th. So you are invited to gather items at home. We're gonna have a collection date on the 7th. Um, you're also welcome to just send in cash donations. Those are always welcome uh, as our food banks can extend those dollars even further than we could. Um, and we will see how many cans we can collect and how we can bless those in our community who might not have enough this season. In two weeks, we're going to have our annual congregational meeting. It will be on Zoom after our time of worship. Uh, the purpose of the meeting is to hear an update from session and hear just an update on when we might be gathering in person again in this coming year. So all members are encouraged to attend uh, and we will talk business in the life of the church. And finally, Compassionate Curiosity is going to happen today. This is our gathering that we have on the first and third Sundays. It takes place after prayer and praise. And it's a time when we are doing the work of dismantling systemic racism. And we are diving into some hard topics and doing this work that the church very much needs to do. And so I invite you, if you're able to stick around for that conversation after prayer and praise time today. Hear now our charge and benediction. 
Friends, remember that God entered into this world as a humble baby and that God experienced all the growing pains of life as a child and as an adolescent. And it matters that God has experienced what we have as children and youth. And God has a special place in God's heart for all children. Let us remember that as we engage in the life of the church. And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. And those who are here on Zoom, I invite you to unmute yourselves and we will share the peace with one another with that familiar greeting by saying, the peace of Christ be with you. Be with you. Peace be with you, Jacob. Yeah, he keeps going. Peace, 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 peace be with you, Unegu family. Peace be peace with you, all. Peace, Robert. <laughs> peace, Danita. Peace of Christ. <laughs> oh, Robert. Peace with you, Grace. Peace be with each one of you. Which one are they going on? <laughs>